Welcome to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast, where we feature top leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry with your host, Drew Hendricks. Now, let's get started with the show. Drew Thomas Hendricks here. I'm the host of the Legends Behind the Craft podcast, where I talk with leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry. Today, I have a co-host on the show, Bianca Harmon, who's our D2C strategist. Past guests of Legends Behind the Craft include Daniel Dow of Dow Vineyards, Joe Wagner of Copper Cane Wine and Provisions, and Ken Freeman of Freeman Winery. If you haven't listened to these yet, be sure to check them out and subscribe. Today's episode is sponsored by Barrels Ahead. At Barrels Ahead, we work with you to implement a -a one-of-a-kind marketing strategy, one that highlights your authenticity, tells your story, and connects you with your ideal customers. In short, we help wineries and craft beverage producers unlock their story to unleash their revenue. Go to barrelsahead.com today to learn more. I am super excited to talk to today's guest, Guillaume Fraub. He's the owner and winemaker of Close Lean in Paso Robles. Now, Guillaume comes from a family of grape growers and winemakers. He grew up in the southeast of France in the commune of Narbonne and moved to Bordeaux when he was 24. Now, Bordeaux offered a lot of new winemaking challenges due to the region's different climates, soil, and varietals. And not convinced that Bordeaux was the place for him, Guillaume took an internship at La Ventura in Paso Robles. In 2007, he realized his dream, launching his own brand, Close Celine, with his wife, Celine Fraub. Welcome to the show, Guillaume. Welcome. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you so much for being on. So, Guillaume, tell, tell me about this, um, how you got from Bordeaux to Paso and found Close Celine. Yeah, so actually, if we deep go deep, a little bit deeper, I would say yeah. uh, it was my second home. I grew up in southeast of France, uh, number six generation, making wine and growing grapes in languedoc Roussillon, exactly in Corbière, which is kind of very close to the Mediterranean. Mm-hmm. And in 1999, my dad and my mom decided to, to sell it and move to Bordeaux. So it was kind of my second home over oh. there. Uh, that's how we started. Actually. Why did they decide to move to Bordeaux? Corbiere is yeah. beautiful. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I love Nongo, <laughs> beautiful. But I think they were looking for something new. Uh, they wanted to get kind of uh, finally their own thing because, you know, five generations has quite a bit of weight, oh, yeah. you know. So uh, so for sure, but Bordeaux actually is uh, the place where I, actually, I, I met Solen, you know, my wife. Oh, oh you did? So it was, it was fate. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, you know, a big loss for a big win. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, that's great. How long were you in Bordeaux? So Bordeaux, I stayed, I would say, only two years. Mm-hmm. Uh, so a very short time because, you know, uh, they, they sold. I was 20 years old. I stayed in Languedoc a little bit to help my dad to sell the estate. I was at school, help him to work on, his, uh, on the vineyard while he was in Bordeaux launching his new brands. Mm-hmm. And he sold it in, 2000, in 2002. So I kind of went back to Bordeaux in 03, but moved to California in 04, just for one year internship, just like you said, with Laventure in Bass Robles, um, which I thought he was in Mexico to be uh, quite. <laughs> <laughs> I say, great. I've never been to Mexico. So, and then I Google it and they say, well, it's actually in California, you know? So um, it was pretty cool to see that. And the top of that, the, we say the, the sherry on the pie, he was talking French, which was amazing because it, I didn't talk English then, you know, oh. so that was really good. Oh, so that's... when did you learn English? You know, it definitely uh, right here, you know, one word after another. Um, I had a straight rule every day. I said, I got to learn 20 words every day, no matter how many hours uh, we were doing during harvest, I got to work on my English. So it took me a year to start to pronounce some word and be good and understand maybe five years. <laughs> wow. Impressive. Oh, that's great. Uh, it's, been, it's been 17 now. If I don't learn English in 17 years, I go back to France, maybe, you know. <laughs> <laughs> How did, um, what drew you to Paso? I'm sorry, uh, Drew? What, what brought you to, uh, other than getting the internship, did the region itself interest you at the time or you were just in, looking for a change? You know. Um, why my dad told me he was moving to Bordeaux, I said to him, you know, if I'm going to take over the, the business of Bordeaux, I really 
at this time, take a step back and learn English, see what was happening with New World Wine. That was mm -hmm. back in 2003 at that time when I started to look for it. And I was looking for Chile, Argentina. Nobody responded. But mm -hmm. through a really good connections, I said, what about past horrors? I know a guy, uh, Stefan Aceo. And we started like that, you know. So I hook up with my phone. I said, you know, um, I love to work with you. And he said, okay, come over. He took him a few phone call to say yes. Um, but he said, okay, let's do 10 months together. And after you go back to your home. And so okay. and we never got back home. You know, we stayed never over there. Came. That's amazing. And your, and your wife, um, Solange, she was in Spain at this time. Absolutely. She was in Spain. So it was pretty much a year we were separated. She was doing her things. I was doing mine. And he said, you know, if we love each other, you know, let's reconnect and see if we, uh, and, you know, of course, you know, when you get separated quickly, you see how many, how much you love your partner. Yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. So what, so you decided you stayed in Paso. What, what, what was the driving thing that caused you to stay in Paso or your desire to like create a winery and a whole life in Paso? That's a really good question. I think, um, when you decide to stay to one spot, it's a lot of things, you know, where you actually, you, you like the life. I never been to US first, mm -hmm. which was big uh, for me was a big take. Uh, I was amazed on this country, how great the people were. Really remind me where I grew up inside of France, very kind of inviting and, and all of that, you know, was really huge, mm -hmm. very inviting and be, oh, you know, come to my house. And especially when you French guy come over, doesn't speak English, you know, mm -hmm. that very helpful. Um, and after the second part is definitely the passion I have for wine, for wine making and wine growing. Right away when I landed, uh, Stefan, I said, went to grab me to the airport. Mm -hmm. You know, a guy with very long hair. Right away, I said, that's him, you know, dirty. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, and uh, came back to the estate and I was in love already. As soon as I came in with the door, you know, open the gates, see the dirt, um, kind of the climate, a lot of things definitely kind of reminded me where I grew up. I said, wow, that's a great spot. Mm -hmm. And months, he said, do you want to stay longer? You know, I need an assistant, you know, so I stayed and I stayed 10 years with him. Yeah. Oh, wow. Huh, that's so. amazing. Now, so talk to me a little bit about like, so there's Paso and you've got um, Corbier. The growing conditions, they're, they're somewhat similar, but different too. How would you describe the difference between the way you grew up making wine and the, what you're doing now? Yes. Yeah, so the main difference will be uh, temperature and wind. I would say mm. very windy where I grew up in Languedoc. Uh, super windy is like, you know, you get those nerves by the winds. It gets you very nervous about it, you know, because it's so windy. Everything mm -hmm. up and you get, you know, uh, that was one thing. The second thing, I think it's the difference with past robots is the fact we have those shift temperature wise, you know, cool and warm. Mm -hmm. uh, we did Languedoc. And so for that, I think we can do better on a lot of vitals, uh, different than where I grew up in Languedoc, where temperature are good also. But I think here we have more potential to do better things in mm -hmm. higher quality level. Versus like, so you're more like, what, what would you say that was Languedoc, you got Carignan and Grenache, Grenache and yeah, we were very you are, and you're on the west side of um, Paso. And what, 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 what are the varietals that you're really concentrating on? It's pretty much the same. Grenache, you are We also do Cabernet, Sauvignon. Uh, and we do rights uh, such as Roussan and Bionier. Mm -hmm. Blanc. So I've done those there with my dad. Uh, but I think when I finally moved, the one take I would say of that is definitely about meeting Solent was huge. And also meeting new people, meeting a new area such as Bordeaux, because it's a bit more, cl I would say, colder, closer. Mm -hmm. But when people, when people start to know you, they definitely open the door very nicely and, and for a long time. Then longer dogs definitely like open right away, but sometime, you know, it can close, you know, a little bit on you. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, and, and the weather, I mean, Bordeaux is huge on being colder, rainy, really good for Merlot, really good for Cab, mm -hmm. you know, that was actually a, a good learning experience to see my dad making wine over there, helping him a little bit before I moved to California. Mm -hmm. I would think that's a very, I mean, Bordeaux is a very different growing environment on the, on the flatlands and yeah. 
soil and that you, you do have that co real coastal, but Paso will get some of that coastal wind, but you're still miles in, inland. So yeah, as you describe a little bit Paso, you know, in couple of words, what is Paso? Paso is stuck between Lake San Francisco, you know, central coast considered. And I think what's great about Paso, you have the one one splitting, splitting the AVA between the east and the west. Both can do great things mm -hmm. at the levels. I choose to be more closer to the ocean because I'm, you know, definitely more toward hillside, rocky soil for the rones, such as Grenache, Hiram, Oved. And if you can be a little bit cooler toward the ocean, it's some points of getting more complexity to the wine. And that's big these days, big. Yeah. Yeah, I was talking to Daniel Dow about that. He's also on the west side. And it's such a big, it's such a big area. It's hard to describe Paso with just one geography. With you got the Templeton Gap going in there, and yeah, but I think great wine from both sides mm -hmm. is just for the how we say the you say the composition of the fruit, and again with the weather with the weather getting warmer, I think if we can be closer to the ocean, it's always a bit cooler, you know, because getting warmer. You see mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. So let's. I want to shift for one second here and talk to me about you went from an internship. So in 2007, founding your own brand, how did you go about making that happen? <laughs> so first <laughs> of all, it was definitely a, a duo with Solène, you know, so the name is after her. Uh -huh. uh, definitely the, um, the core of the brand is the, the love story behind and between us two. And I think, you know, Solène always kind of uh, so, see me as very eager, eager to start and do things because I'm a kind of entrepreneur. I like, to, I like working. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I started in 2005 thinking about it, you know, mm -hmm. okay, let's start our brand. And then I said, yeah, I can do this. I can do that. I say, hold on, hold on. Why don't you wait a little bit more? And then she was right. I'm glad we started in 07 because um, I think we were more ready at that time. Mm -hmm. I was maybe like 26 years old. But, um, you know, we were looking for the best block to start yeah. our wine. It was Roussan. It was white wine. Oh, so, really? Yeah. It wasn't red. It was white because I used to make Roussan. Uh -huh. You know, Roussan, first of all, unknown. And second of all, the price point of the wine was definitely high. It was $60 a bottle because I knew all the work I was going to put into this wine, you know, um, um, from the get-go. Mm -hmm. So did, that didn't help to kind of start the brand. And of course, 08 came right after the big crash. But <laughs> yeah. it, 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 you know... <laughs> Starting a brand in 08 at this price point of that, it was like, but it's okay because it's a huge passion we have. And I think uh, we are very uh, gathered toward the, 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 the customer and uh, we love meeting people and we love, you know, sharing wine. And I think that helps after starting the brand, you know, one bottle shed with another and then that's how we start. Absolutely. Did you start, did you start by purchasing grapes or getting a contract or how did you, for, for us aspiring winemakers, how? Did you go out and how did you get your first um, great, great? Great, yeah. The first lot, I would say, or first batch. I would say what's great about America is this, you know, you can buy in fruits uh, and make your, start to make wine, I would say, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and then you can do wherever you want. So in France, it's very difficult. You have to own the, uh, you have to have your own seller. So to start off brand in France, it would take a little bit longer. Now, I think it changed a little bit. Yeah, okay, yeah. You know, I mean, it seems like all the grapes are just purchased and allocated in France, and it's harder to start a new winery. Yes, somehow they are allocated. Um, I think you can start on a small batch, but to be honest, it's very hard. It's super mm -hmm. hard. And here, Custom Crush, you know, um, I was lucky enough, Stefan said, you know, you can grab this corner of the estate, of the, the winery, you can make your wine. So that's how I was doing kind of dual work. Oh, that's was, fantastic. Yeah. You know, pay the bills with yeah. your work and then selling slowly your brand, you know, and that was, I think it was hard because Swain got pregnant, you know, two kids in between. But the good thing is we didn't leave the work. Um, so when I left L'Aventure, Closeland was already 1,200 members. We started to have some, you know, definitely some revenue coming in. It was like, mm -hmm. not like from starting from scratch. You see what mm -hmm. I mean? You know. When you started so, Closeland, did how, were you selling directly to consumers or did you start selling through the through stores and restaurants first? Yeah, so that was clear 
you know, the pact with a store and we said, okay, if we do something, we're not going to take a loan to buy the estate or whatever. We start small, we buy a ton of fruit, we make two barrels. And then when you make those two barrels, you know, <laughs> it was done because that work for two barrels is pretty quickly done. Even if the first six years, we were actually renting the rows and doing all the work on the vineyard to save money, you know, mm-hmm. instead of buying by the acre, like today it is, uh-huh. today, acre. They do all the work for you. So in for five years, the first five, I did all the work to kind of save money, which was great, you know, definitively. Oh, yeah. But the selling point was like, okay, who are you? What? $60 of Rusan? You're crazy. You see, you see what I mean? <laughs> so, but it's okay. I always, I was never afraid of things. And we started to do like a couple, a really good hotel, you know, serving at the lobby. So, you oh. know, and so starting the list, that was good. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I would say the big thing who started us was actually post ranching at Big Sur. We had a really good connection with them and we started to do dinners. And then the mail, the, the mail list started to be uh, built. And then you meet one guy, you meet a second guy, you know. Uh, after what, 12 years, we have uh, 30, 200 members now on the wine club. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Post ranching, that's, that's an amazing place. Oh, gosh. Yeah. I was there once. <laughs> awesome. It's a, yeah, that's a marquee place to get your wine in. So that's, <laughs> so there's your foothold. And those people can appreciate $60 recent. <laughs> so what are you using these days for your marketing? I'm sorry, uh, Bianca? What are you using these days for your marketing? Uh, we don't do any marketing. We just uh, do ourselves. Yeah. All the, um, all the literatures we do are in a house. Um, we have kind of clear idea what we want. We're very simple. It's, it's, you know, we're family and, you know, uh, so yeah, I mean, definitely what's, um, I have a friend who helped me to kind of draw sometimes some stuff. Um, but m- for the most part, we are doing all in the house. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Amazing. How many cases are you selling? We are doing 4,500 cases now. Yeah. 40, 4,500. And most of that is going directly to consumers or throughout the yeah. restaurants and three tier? Yeah, we do pretty much 95% direct to consumer, you know, 2%, maybe 1% in the market a little bit here mm-hmm. and there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're fairly, uh, we do host tasting one on one. It's very, for me, the hospitality is kind of the, the root also yeah. of the brand. And we are trying to do our best. We are not, I'm not saying we are the best, but we're trying to do very, uh, our best as much as we can. But you can please everybody. That's the thing, you know. Well, that's the thing. If you please everybody, you please no one. You, you got to people. You got to polarize the people in order to be successful. That's the kind of guys they never know. You know, in France, we always struggle to get customers. And for me, whatever time it is, if you want a guy wants to come taste, of course. Now we have hours more and more. Uh-huh. You know, from the get go when we started close, and we never said no because it's 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 a bread and butter. You know. It's all about the experience. Yeah. So from the from the start, you always just started with the hospitality, with the experience, and then always. the word spread. So w- when did you move into the the estate? So uh, uh, 07 was the first year we had the first bottle. 14 when we moved out from when I stopped L'Aventure. Uh, I at that time I was making 500 cases. Mm-hmm. Tinsley, we moved in 14. Uh, we moved. I think we uh, started to produce thousand cases. And right away, when I moved to Tin City, I already put my head on the front forward to get our dream is to get a, 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 on land, you know. So I was oh, seven. Yeah. And that's when Tin City started in 14, right around then, right? Technically, I think the downturn didn't help, but technically it started in 2011, 2012. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think the, fir- the first brand launched Tin City was um, uh, Taurin, um, Scott Harley. Uh, Nicora, um, I think those two were the, the really the first ones, you know, in the in that area. Yeah. Yes. We, uh, here's a just for the, the listeners out there. There's an amazing documentary on um, YouTube about Tin City cider or, or Tin City, the whole um, kind of. I want I don't want to say commune, but it's like a marketplace of um, food and wine, and there's a cider, beer, wine shops there. Yes, they made the documentary, right? Did, did, that, um, yeah. did, that, did that document, I mean, did that community help help you kind of grow? And it's always, 
hey, we are a community, I think, uh, say no, it'll be totally stupid to say no, because I think we help each other on a daily basis, you know. Mm -hmm. Has tourism come, is tourism pretty heavy through that area now in Tin City? Yes, yes. And it's funny because now we see some pattern of people actually going on estate more during the weekends. And, you know, maybe the Fridays they do Tin City. It's, it's funny how you get some couple of patterns like that, you know. Yeah. Uh, because we can get really busy in Tin City, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's, yeah, um, it's a great spot. I love Tin City. It's you getting know, very it, it is. I, I'll, I'll be going up there a few months from now. And um, as far as close to lane, with the, we, we talk a lot about the pandemic and how you had to close down your experiences. But as you're opening up now, as we're going into the summer of 2022, what has, has it caused any changes in the way you've done marketing or winery or had your um, in-person experiences? So it's funny how you hear with the pandemic, some people get really injured by the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Some did not, and they actually triple what they were doing. Mm -hmm. so I think for us, in our, in what we do in wine making and and how we say hospitality and and selling wine to direct to consumer, it's funny because what we were doing before COVID actually fit the whole COVID um, situation in a way that we were all doing testing by appointments. We had yes. those. They were all separated groups. And people ask me, oh, did you do that for COVID? I say, no, we were doing that before, you know? So I think that played on our favor because we were already set up, you know? Yeah. So that was that was awesome. Of course, we had to be more, we had to be more careful and do more in guidelines and, you know, mm -hmm. and all of that, which I totally get it. Uh, so for us, it didn't change. And on the selling point, it did change. I would say, it, it was actually better because it definitely pushed us to think differently further by keeping the team uh, uh, here at the estates, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, we had to kind of brainstorm. We said, okay, guys, you know, we have to work on this. I don't want to lose you. And coming back in two years, maybe you will not come back. No, you stay here. Let's mm -hmm. do this together, you know. And so we developed things that people have done all over the place, like virtual tastings. Uh -huh. uh, all of those things. I think it really helped to keep the connection with the, the guests. And that was huge, and especially with our members, mm -hmm. because about three releases in virtual, which means was sending about, I think we bought all small bottles, about 4,000 small little vials. Oh, yeah. You know, throughout, throughout the uh -huh. year. So it was a lot of work. <laughs> Oh, yeah, he can tell me. Yeah, I, you bring, bring up a great point, though, about how you were positioned perfectly to, not perfectly, but you were positioned for your tasting experience to move into this pandemic with the more intimate custom experiences, which is what you've been doing all along. I think some of those wineries that had the people three deep at the tasting bar, that, that, that model didn't work anymore. Yes, yeah. But the, the good turn on this, you know, I think they, they changed their model Mm -hmm. Because he tried the one-on-one -on -one testing. Say, oh my gosh, you know, you can sell more. It's more private. Mm -hmm. You know, I think people stick to it because they saw how beneficial it was. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your experiences that you offer at Close Lane that sets you apart. You mean experience in terms of like the wine? Like, like, sort of the tasting experience. Like, what, what's it like to come taste at your estate? Um, so, uh, we, you have to take an appointment. Um, mm -hmm. Guest comes in and you have a host that we train uh, in in house. Of course, mm -hmm. the hosts are with us for some time, and so they they go through the stories, through the wines, and I think I'm really really um, kind of pushy about this with our uh, host is to know the customer who is coming, and you know it's basically red carpet for everybody. You know, uh, it's you know I think it's very important for the guest to be good, feeling good in an environment that mm -hmm. it's all. It's, you know, kids might uh, throw some uh, nerf gun on the top of it sometime. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's very toward the, the, yeah, the customer. And I'm huge on that. And I think we can still do better. But I hate when people are not happy. Uh, mm -hmm. I want people happy, you know, when they come. Yeah. Have you seen the, your customer base from, you know, 2007, you know, 14 years from now? How has the, how has the customer evolved over the last decade and a half? Oh my gosh, that's a really good question. Um, I don't think it changed. You know? No. Yeah, it's, it's, it, I, 
I, I think about that quite a bit because I've been yeah. selling wine since the 90s. And I see the young, I see a younger group coming in more often now. And I see um, a little bit of the um, pomp and circumstances being removed from it. People are feeling a little more open. It, it, do you see that at all? Like a little less of that? Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I said general when I said, you know, didn't change because I keep, I see the people who are already working like, you know, 50 and more has already worked for so long, you know, someone on the side. So they were buying wine. So that didn't change, you know, the patterns. Mm -hmm. But I think um, the COVID really kind of start to change a lot. You see a lot of now family coming with their kids, oh. you know, much more, I think, because now <laughs> they really want to get out also. Yeah. But, I see all this pattern coming, still coming. So that's the first uh, thing I, we see. And you're right. The second, I think you start to see a lot of people younger starting to be like exploring about wines in a good way, you know, in a really good way. So, mm -hmm. which is very encouraging too, you know? Yes. Yes. It, it, that's a good point with the families. Cause it, back in the nineties, it was really a, um, you know, you'd take a date wine tasting or you'd be on out on a guy's golf weekend and you might go wine tasting, but you wouldn't, it wasn't really a family type of event to head to head yep. to the winery. So that, <laughs> I, I like to see that that's, that's where, and I, I see it too. We go, um, more, I go wine tasting more often than I care to admit <laughs> with, but it, it is becoming more of a, more of a weekend event for people yep. and their, and their, and their families. Do you and allow as as, families at your, at your tastings, do you allow families? Because some wineries don't actually allow families. Yes, we do. So, uh, Bianca, what we try to do, it's, uh, it's a maximum group of six to eight. Okay. So, by the size, sometimes we definitely reduce because our permit doesn't go further than that. So, we try to be very staying on that patterns, you know. So, maximum six to eight people coming. And but you and you allow children. That's just good for the listeners to hear that. Yeah, if you have kids and are trying to go out wine tasting, that they can come to you still. Yeah, so that's a good question. Also, you bring up because you know it's uh, after they come, you know, they taste or don't taste, or how many people is it? So of course, like I said, we try to be very vigilant of that, and uh, it's uh, I I I don't want we say no, but you know yeah. we always. Have a room to you know you see what i mean totally probably would rather have a family than a um, bridal party come in <laughs> <laughs> those are really fun too <laughs> <laughs> two very different we, styles we try to find a spot where they can have fun where it's not because when you do intimate settings you know everybody's their own time it's absolutely fine but it's a matter of where you put people at because it can be louder and some people are like really coming from, I know, from Iowa. Mm -hmm. They took meant like six months ago. They know he's intimate. And then you have a party close by. Oh, you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. You start to get back. So it's just a matter of separating. So somebody from Iowa, how did they find you? <laughs> I took, I, actually, we have quite a bit of people coming from Iowa. I mean, definitely, Drew, I think in 14 years, and Bianca, you asked me about this. We never, I, I don't want to say I didn't want to be cheap on the marketing, but I said, we are going to be limiting our production and I want to take time to sell this wine, but strongly, I don't want to be over time getting 2000 members mm -hmm. because the score of something else. I said, let's go slowly is one bottle at a time. I always say to that to everybody. And I feel it's a very, the best way because it's strong and you know, it's, um, you know, it's, it's the way we did, you know, mm -hmm. very good. So, question actually pardon oh just uh, <laughs> how the people find you from iowa i mean it's word of mouth yeah yeah so exactly so one bottle after one bottle yeah exactly quickly that matches out um kind of jumping ahead or jumping into the future so with global so we talk a lot about global warming and the climate change and how growing conditions are just shifting how do you see paso robles evolving over the next 14 20 years in your wine making that's actually a straight shot. 14 years is hard to, hard to, hard to see. Although <laughs> the day I was reading an article in New York Times, you know, uh, you were looking at the, the, the trend of the temperature. Three trends it was. It was, okay, if we do nothing, it's very bad. If we keep doing like we're doing, we're actually in great shape. 
Oh, we mm. can you even do better? You know, so it's hard to kind of project in 14 years. But definitely in France, you know, I, I remember my grandfather taught me about things that I start to see again. And I think cycle, you know, and those mm. cycles can go and we take oh. care of them. I think it's a matter of uh, how to plant a vineyard that will last a long time. And thinking was a drought, you know. Yeah, because you got to plant with you got to plant with fourteen years in your horizon. It takes about yeah. seven just for them to get where they need to be. Yeah, absolutely. And in the past, they were planting for hundred years, you know, mm-hmm. not twenty. Yeah. So, um, I think those techniques that I'm lucky enough to see from my family, but they that been spending more money. So let's talk quickly about those things. Sure. Um, it's um it's viticulture wise it's pretty easy you want to have vine kind of root very deep correct mm-hmm. it's pretty simple by that you have to choose your rootstock the rootstock you have some who grow horizontally doesn't go deep or you have some are super strong you know mm-hmm. and my maker what do you think one can do with the other so a light profile root will give you quicker a vine that suffer because it doesn't grab the water mm. And the one go deeper quickly will give you a lot of power, a lot of fruits. Mm-hmm. And as a maker, we are always seeking for the best quality and say, oh, which one quality do you want? You know, I say, okay, I want the small fruit right away, not the big one. The mm-hmm. problem, how the small fruit will end in 20 years, but unfortunately, it's going to crash. Then mm-hmm. the big fruit become very mature and be excellent for another 40 years behind. You see what I mean? Oh, I do. I do. So it's very. It's very down to that. So that's that's a kind of the base one. I would say base two is your spacing. If you have a lot of vines per acre, of course, it's going to be much more competitions and smaller berries. Do you want that? Maybe we should be more in the middle. Mm-hmm. I think we're going back to that. And the point number three is um, the height. You know, you have a very tall guy. He will need maybe more food to be running. Same uh-huh. thing with. You know, if you create a vine right away from the planting, smaller, you don't ask much, you don't feed it to be low, uh, I would say crop and things like that. You know, you train, it's a train, you know, Mm -hmm. and the training starts from day one. So if you do that training very well, I think the vine will last no matter what's going to happen. What what are you planning? In in your area, in your area. In, In your area. So for pasta, what would you say? Moderation with the for the spacing, don't cram them in there. Yeah, I would say uh, you got Daniel Dow recently. He has a very special site where he has beautiful cabernet over there, different soils. Uh, Pasto can do actually very well on cab and rones. That's the beauty of it. Yes, uh, I know yeah. it for rones more than cabs, but Dan- Daniel was yeah. very. <laughs> he, he's proven Cabernet's work there. <laughs> I, I've always thought of pasta with with Rones, but he he set me straight. <laughs> so definitely a, a big majority of the vineyard in Pasto is planted Cabernet. You know, from mm-hmm. east side to west side, but more on the east side. I would say, like you said, Drew, the Rhone became uh, very famous here because a few people got hundred points: Justin Smith, Stefan Aceo, uh, Dinner, Epoch. I mean, all those core wine that got a very big press to the area, push Paso on the run map. And people think about- He also got Tablas Creek. Tablas Creek, yeah. I forgot to mention Tablas, you're absolutely right. I think Tablas Creek was the first one. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And they've got, yeah, they're they're one of my favorite wines. I like the softer style there. Yeah, I agree with you because I think Tablas has, you know, a magic behind, you know, with with Bocassel, it's very softer wines with Mm -hmm. great density. But soft. I was actually in South Carolina this weekend. It was actually a panel with inside nine wines, and it was part of it. Definitely, you can feel it. It's beautiful wines. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and John Alban was the first one planting grapes in pastoral, I mean, uh, in the area, Sofra Coast. Came in with the first rounds with Gary Eberly pulling the first year in 1975, I think. And I think Tablas came right after that. And, you know, L'Aventure and all those new people, Saxum, and all those people start to follow. And, you know, mm-hmm. luckily enough for us, we can jump on the train already advanced, you know? Yes. Yes. Now, how would you describe the close to lean house style? It's definitely like everybody house, uh, you know, as a wine in pastoral rules. Um, I would say my taste tend to be a little more towards, um, I would say some wine I like to drink on a daily basis, some softness. Mm-hmm. Um, it's your flagships. 
What, would your, flag, what would your flagship wine be? Uh, it's our Syrah. It's Hommage à nos pères. It's a Syrah uh, co-fermented with Gionier. Mm. It has definitely more body than the Fleur de Solène on Harmony, uh, which are the more Grenache, uh, heavy or Syrah lighter style because uh, we, we produce about 150 lots at Clos Solène. It's a lot of lots for small wine we, we are. Mm -hmm. But we can cherry pick to make each wine the way we want. You know, uh, We don't blend right away. We wait. 12 to 15 months before to blend. Mm -hmm. And we always do it at the end to be very specific on the profile of the oak and things like that. Awesome. Have you seen that um, your house style evolve over the last 14 years? Yes. Yep. Absolutely. And the big and one is, I'm sorry, go ahead, Drew. And is that, is that, is the house style evolved due to the consumer's tastes, like with them wanting a different type, or is it your style of winemaking that's kind of shifted it? No, it's definitely um, lucky enough. We are small enough to, <laughs> I would say, listen to us and listen and do what we like to do. That mm -hmm. I think it's a craft, and each one we have their own craft, and they have their own, you know, people to buy that. I think I really the vision I have since twenty two thousand seven. It's the same in terms of making it. Mm -hmm. I did the making of it. What I've been evolving or changing a little bit, it's more the, the drinkability. I okay. came from France with knowledge, Aaron, and then when you are 23, oh, you think you know everything too? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and then I came with everything I kind of learned with my dad since four years old and start to kind of do it. I say, I do my own fruit, I go and exactly do the same thing. And I took a big wall, big wall, because you're in California, <laughs> you know, a French boy, you know. We are here, you know, but not in France. So, yeah. so I think it was a big adjustment for five years. So I adjust my, the, I would say the viticulture side of it because it's my definitely first passion is making great fruits. Mm -hmm. And from 14 years ago to today, it's towards less alcohol. The same concentration with less alcohol. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me you do it. It's my, it's my uh, drive. It's, for me, the acidity is the spine. And when you talk about Tabras Creek, I always think about those wines because they have acid, they have a beautiful uh, complexity, and they will be, in a way, softer. And I yeah. think you'll see when you're in a party, the bottles empty are the ones that are easier to drink and really, really good. And the ones that are very hard to drink are usually full, you know. It's way easier to wake up the next morning drinking a bottle of Tablas than <laughs> like a Herman story. <laughs> Uh, two different styles. I love both of them. They're really <laughs> it's, but in terms of um, of making it, it's tough. It's tough to make a kind of a softer wine with less, less alcohol and mm -hmm. concentration. I mean, it's a very tough thing. And we can do it. It's just a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I greatly admire that. And the, going towards that same just powerful flavor, but without having to like substitute the flavor with alcohol to get what you need to to get, yeah. get, get that punch to it. Yeah. And then, I don't know if you saw, but Paso, you get you do blind test, you'll not notice the alcohol. Maybe up to the next day, you're right. <laughs> 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 but w when you taste the wine, you, I'm sure you ask 10 people, and they'll think, ah, maybe 14 and a half, and but 16, because yes. we have such superior soil, whether that is actually together. You don't really feel it. But as a winemaker, you know, the finest, I think I talk about more the finest, the elegance is, is start there. It's, it's those, those heats, you know, even if it's good acid, it's still there. And I think it's what we are really repounding every year and getting very honest. Getting in the acids. And what about the yeast? Are you using native yeast in your wines? Or? Um, so if you think about the way we are making wine, so 150 lots, which is usually a lot size for a much bigger size of winery. Mm -hmm. Automatically, when you have a lot of lots, you want to be really careful because we talk about fruit we buy from the, I mean, fruit we have from the estate, mm -hmm. which we did a lot of plantings. So this year we're going to be producing 100%, 100% about 40% of the crop. But this, the other 60 are purchased fruits. And when you make a lot of lots, different varietals, I prefer to cover you know, I won't say the next word. Um, uh, and then make sure I have yeast that I'm growing are not going to be 
you know, um, not to be bad for the wine. And you see what I mean? So I want to be safe. And so I'm using yeast from the markets. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. So just right that. And as far as barrels, how are you, how are you sourcing your barrels now? So I asked one, one time, one guy in France, I said, you know, how long it took you to really make your wine? It was like a very old house. Mm -hmm. He said, uh, sir, it took me 40 years to redial the barrels, the yeast. The, you see what <laughs> I mean? They say, wow, thank you. <laughs> I have a long way to go. <laughs> um, so I'm still, I'm still doing trials. I was doing much more trials in the past with more coopers. But as we get refined, to find this refineness, the elegance, it's, it's the maturity, it's the alcohol, mm -hmm. it's the yeast, it's how much pump over, and the most part is the barrel. And the barrel, I'm really dialing now into the details, and, and now I have only like three to four coopers only, oh. uh, because they give me what I'm looking for, you know, um, why having 20, if you can afford that, actually, you do better with, you know. Sure. Uh, so what style of barrels are you gravitating towards so to not to be too much french french uh, french side is french uh, french <laughs> <laughs> nice tight grain <laughs> uh tight grain or maybe not as tight but the main thing with oak mm -hmm. um about this is some oak are going to give you more i would say uh, sweetness mm -hmm. some are going to give you more and the toast also is playing but the toast, the oak we are choosing on forest, we are grabbing forest, are grabbing more freshness to the wine. No. Oh, enhancing more the freshness, minerality. Then having this oak cover of sweetness and make the wine fatter. So I'm more toward that freshness again by the mm -hmm. oak provenance than the opposite of the oak. I mean, than the opposite, which is more fat. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. So you sourcing are sourcing all your barrels from France right now? Yes, we are. Yeah. Um, you know, some people are trying to tend me on Hungary and Oak for whites. The problem when you put wine in barrel, if it's a trial, if it doesn't work, what do you do with it? It's wasted. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge loss, you know. So it's definitely something we are not anymore trying. So, you know, we stick to what we know. If we do a trial, it's one barrel, but this barrel has to be the parameter I'm looking for. And we see how they exalt, you know. Mm -hmm. Are, Are you, you looking at any different pa packaging? Like, um, not, not box wines, but like mm -hmm. beyond just the glass, like with all the glass shortages, everyone's kind of reevaluating their, their packaging. Have you guys looked at making any changes there? Yes. Uh, maybe Bianca, you had a question on what I was talking before. before oh, I was just going to ask if you were using new French oak or used or what, what your percentages were on your barrels. So we use both um, both neutral and, and yolk. Now we are down to pretty much size for each of the wines, like Grenache, Mauvais. There are more um, wine, uh, you know, on the fruit. It's very light tannins. So we go bigger barrels, like mm. four to 500 liters, or even Amphora. Mm. Syrah, at the past, it was small barrels like the Cabernet. The problem was giving me too much oak. And he was covering the Syrah. So now we move the Syrah on the 300 and 320, which we call that hog's head or Syrah, cigar barrels. Mm -hmm. And the Cabernet, you know, as young as they are, all tiny they have, they are definitely more in 225 liters barrels, so smaller barrels. And then on the three programs, Grenache, Mouvet, never get New York. Syrah gets about 60% New York on our blends. Oh. And then it gets 80% of New York. Okay, interesting. So, Mark, Mark, I mean, the packaging is a really good question. I'm asking a lot myself uh, <laughs> at this point. Not to fight to kind of, yes, every money is one point, but the thing we hear a lot, I was talking about the weather in 2015, 20, in, in uh, 2100. I mean, how do you, how you say 2100? <laughs> oh, it's weird. 2100? <laughs> yeah. 100 century, I mean, no, I mean, whatever. We haven't so gotten there yet. <laughs> when, when that is coming repetitive with all the things we see with the weather due to what we do today, you know, I started, okay, what our part can we do? You know, we can reduce, you know, some things. And I think the one thing we can do is the weight of our bottles. And uh, starting next year, we're changing all the line of bottles. 
and it would be decreasing the weight about 40%. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, I was, I was always looking at Jan- Jancis Robson always has on Twitter the latest heavy bottle that she found. It's just it's just a big waste to have that. It, it's a big waste, but it looks so good. Bottle. <laughs> it looks so good. <laughs> it looks good. <laughs> so at this point, you have to look, okay, do you care for your child in 50 years or do you care for your look right now? You know, yeah. so it's, so I definitely, so it's a big hurt because I'm still looking at the bottles and I have them here. Look at, you know, it's samples, oh, yeah. you know, I look at them every day. So what do we do? We don't do, now we pull the trigger. We're going to do it. And, um, and the customer, we're going to save a ton of money on, on shipping as well. Yeah. 40% weight reduction in the bottle. That's going to add to your bottom line. And also, yeah, the shipping charges. Everybody's Shipping's only getting more expensive. Yeah. but how, I hope the customer will understand the kind of trend while we're doing it because it's not definitely the cost because the bottle costs maybe a little bit more than last week. But when you get this bottle empty, you know, we did a, uh, an event in Arizona and we dumped like 200, 200 bottles. Gosh, mm. I felt so bad for the environment because it was like so much waste on the glass, you know. Do you think it will affect the aging of the wine going to no. lighter no. bottle? No, that's... Mm. No, because the bottle is a bottle. We keep the cork as great quality as we're keeping. So it's it's just the look, you know, that's it. And the feel. Yeah, I so, guess someone could someone could um argue that the thickness of the glass creates the temperature consistency versus yeah. the thin glass wall. But if your wine cellar is any good, you're not going to have that temperature variation anyway. You, you, you're right. But we deal with a clientele who are buying wine and aging and are really careful because when you pay, you know, 60 to 150 to 200, mm-hmm. you don't keep your bottles, you know, outside, you know, yeah. uh, on the sun. So, so that is definitely one thing. And an interesting survey I listened in France and all the big castle, the first growth and all of that are looking at, do we continue to ship all our wine in wood cases? Because mm-hmm. everybody does wood cases in France. In, in Bordeaux, I talk about this survey. Mm-hmm. And then a few people are changing to uh, carton boxes. I mean, it's, it's great to see that. It's great. Yes. Especially like maybe at the upper, upper, upper end wood box. You is usually take it out of the wood box. Having worked in the wine store, we were always um, breaking down wood boxes. Yeah, but as a branding, especially when you start, you want to look at the best, the wood, the bottles, and things like that. So it's definitely a hard step down um, about these bottles. But, you know, I think we have to do our part. Everybody needs to do their part, you know, to help. I, I'm all for it. The th- easy, it'll easier to fit in my wine cellar. Whenever I get a big, heavy bottle, it just won't fit into any of the slots. <laughs> the labels get stuffed. Yeah. Of course, I don't have you know, It's exactly the customer told me, I asked my members, so, you know, I'm, I'm really tempting to change. I say, Guillaume, as long as you fit the mind cellar, I'm okay with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's something to be said for that. Cause most of us do just have those, um, you know, the, they just make a certain size bottle hole that you got to put the bottle in. And yeah. Especially in those vino temp type cellars where they have to slack them on a single rack. If it's a, if the bottle's too big, you can't get, but five or six on that row. Whereas if it's a normal, I don't want to say normal size bottle, you can, it's just set up, you can get all nine across. Yeah. And you read the labels too, you know? Oh yeah. But my, my labels are unsellable. <laughs> and you go to friends. Oh, you say, I don't take this one because the label is ripped. You take another one. You see what I mean? <laughs> mm-hmm. What about corks? Are you, um, have you looked at any different cork type packaging for the closures? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> No, cork, cork is, a, is a religion, I would say. It's like the barrels. I think so, too. And it's, it's one of the most renewable resources, for sure. Uh, gosh, one thing I would never change is the cork. You know, that's for sure. You know, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah for, a, you know, for a wine I'm going to drink tonight or it's not going to age, it's, you know, sometimes it's nice to just take a screw cap to a picnic. But if you're aging it, I do believe me, you need a good cork. I think it's on our mind too because you see a lot of people trying a lot. A few, a few people doing some trial with um, screw cap mm-hmm. and age as well. It's just on my head, you know. I just can't do it. Mm-hmm. Oh, nice. I, I agree. The other trend is the closures, the you know the foil cap on the, yeah. on the cork. Are you guys committed to the caps, or are you going like some of these other wineries that have just taken the caps off their? To me, it looks a little unfinished. 
Yeah, the caps for me always will be here. Um, I think, unfortunately, a few things cannot change much will be the cap. Because like, like you said, it's, it's unfinished. I think the, the bottle shape people will, will, you know, definitely see, oh yeah, but at the time it's changed, it's changed. Mm -hmm. the, something else is like, you know, you forget your coat, you know, you forget, but that's the style I have, you know, I don't say bad for others because some have their own style. I respect, but definitely for us, it's like, I need my coat. <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree. I, I have, I've got a few wines that I collect there where they just stop putting the caps on them. And when I look in the wine cell, it looks like someone maybe yeah. like it, just closed it back up again. <laughs> but you're right. You asked, did they forgot to put it? Mm -hmm. Sometimes? I did ask. I did ask. I did ask. So, Guillaume, as, as we're kind of wrapping down here, what, what, what else can we learn about you? What have we not asked you about that you'd like to talk about? You know, I was mentioning about Binom at the beginning. So um, my brother moved to um, to uh, America when was that, 2009. Um, he actually married my uh, old boss daughter from Laventure when we their daughters. Oh, really? Our note. Yeah, yeah we, we're working with our note on another project. Uh, on Procure, maybe, yeah. Yes. It, and uh, so Arno and I, you know, are definitely, uh, we are four in the family. And I think the two, uh, I mean, of us are the closest in mindset, the way we are doing things and, and all of that. And we say, you know, why don't we do something together? And we launched Binom in 15. Oh, did you? Well, okay. Yeah, Binom, which is actually most Cabernet Sauvignon uh, driven um, with some uh, inspired blends, with some Carignan, some Mourvedre. Um, so definitely on those, and Grenache. Mm -hmm. So different blends, blend with Cabernet. And I think those wines are fantastic. It's just a different uh, winemaking uh, that I do with Closelin. And Arno does all the, all the marketing and the, the sale of the wine, you know, so oh. definitely. Yeah, it's, great, it's a great deal. Um, it's, it's, it's very terrific to work together. Uh, it's like working with your wife sometimes, you know, you, you head, you know. Oh, I, yeah, I can, I can testify to that. But it, it, it always works out for the better. How would you say, the, how is the Beano wines different than Closelin? Already, you, you, you have different varietals. So mm -hmm. as soon as you put on it, it dramatically changed the mm -hmm. style of the wines because cab is tiny, you know. Yeah. Uh, so that, how can you make a cabernet more towards old style cabernet, like old world mm. cabernet? You know, it's, I think, our tweak uh, to do it. And um, a lot of people ask me, oh, why is it so different? You know, I'm, I'm a huge lover of wine maker, wine grower. You know, we can do things differently. You take a painter, he does 20 different paints. You don't ask him why it's different. It's because on his, on his belly, I mean, on his inside of him, he has mm -hmm. the capacity of doing things. It's just like, it's a passion, you know? So, um, and so we're trying to push with Binom is, you know, different, more Cabernet. And that's how we, uh, we do it, you know, different wine making uh, techniques than close to land. Um, and he came very naturally, you know, oh. we try hard to make another wine. It was just natural, which was actually the beauty of it. Kind so, of fun. Yeah. Nice. Pretty, yeah. So, I mean, aside than that, um, you know, we're just um, uh, going to look at the phase three of Close to Land, mm -hmm. which, you know, buying the estate, planting, which that I knew. But when we bought Close to Land, we, um, uh, we knew it was small. Uh, so we're going to extend the winery. We're building a cave starting this year. Oh. And we're yeah, it'd be pretty cool to see. Yeah, in the next uh, couple of years. Yeah, so well, that'll be neat. So that's it. <laughs> that was great. So, Guillaume, where can people find out more about you and your wines? I would say the website is the only way. Uh, unfortunately, you cannot buy wine because we don't have enough. <laughs> it's uh, closefriend.com. Um, uh, we are not so much on social media because that's something that I was always on the fence. Maybe it's a bad thing on me because um, new generation are all on social media and things like that. Mm -hmm. But I'm not somebody who likes to kind of throw things on the social media. You know? uh -huh. <laughs> so you will see us sometime. Uh, we'll promise we can do maybe a little bit better, you know, as much as we can. Uh, but after, you know, the testing room, maybe it's the best way, you know, hospitality, uh, take an appointment and sure. taste a one. And you will be really uh, on the ambience of the, of the winery, you know. Meet, meet a few people, get my son's Nerf gun on the back sometimes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, the buddy winemaker. 
That's great. Well, man, it's such a great, so great to hear your story. Thank you so much for joining us. No, thank you, uh, Drew. I hope I didn't talk too much. It was a uh, thank you, Bianca, for reaching out. Fascinating. Your, your quest for harmony and close lean and branching out into Bino. It's just fascinating. <laughs> thank you. Well, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes. Oh, 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 oh,